Okay, we're ready to start the afternoon uh, session. First speaker is Huri Cristina Tarazzi about uh, exotic string landscape. Thank you. First of all, thank you to the organizers. This has been amazing. As I was saying earlier, uh, I couldn't find a single talk I didn't want to go to, so <laughs> it was really great. Um, <coughs> So I was asked to talk um, about non-geometric constructions. So I'm going to be talking to you about our latest paper from September. And since then, I mean, I've been thinking about many different things with different people. I will tell you maybe something that is, if I have time, more related. But yeah, please feel free to find me and chat about this um, and what things I've been thinking about. So I will try to actually be more constructive for the landscape. I'm talking, talking to you about... Was this me? <laughs> <laughs> OK. OK, so okay, okay. of course I'm going to be talking to you about the string landscape. So we want to basically understand the whole uh, different corners of our string landscape. And like as we've heard a lot the past few days and in general in the communities, um, Kalabiyaos are very nice, geometric string constructions are very nice, but they do lots of our heavy lifting on everything uh, we kind of want to understand, whether it's swampland and trying to understand swampland conditions, swampland like constraints and general things about string theory, not even going into quantum gravity, they're a lot inspired by geometry, whether you're doing QFT or you're doing string phenol, you know, or you just want to, you care about like landscape or Santa model physics or whatever you, you really care about, usually Calabias are pretty nice uh, to work with, but we've put too much uh, work for, the, for these guys. And uh, it would be nice if we can help out and understand also like what, um, what other types of constructions can tell us about interesting questions. So if this big tree is our different sort of geometric constructions, including uh, constructions that maybe could be seen uh, in a more target space and geometric structure, then I can have a little tree here uh, where it will have the non-geometric guys. So this is what I'm going to be talking to you today. And I will be interested to in both discussing these, but also connections with geometry. At the end of the day, we do think that um, things are connected in some nice way, so it would be nice to be able to understand these corners uh, in a more connected way. So let's go to 60 minimal supergravity theories. So as a first example, these guys have eight supercharges, and they have a supergravity multiplet, tensor multiplets, vector, and hyper, and they just have tensor branches and uh, uh, Higgs branches. Uh, because only scalars appear here. D because these are chiral theories, there's a lot of constraints coming from anomalies. So they're pretty much very well constrained. And I'm not going to cite a lot of papers because there's too much. Uh, but uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of ways to understand how these conditions restrict your theory. But what I want you to focus here is that if I have a choice for these uh, coefficients here, these A's and B's that are um, actually part of my charge lattice, uh, they have to satisfy certain relations to uh, cancel anomalies. And if I know the matter, then I know these intersections, these, these inner products. OK. OK, so if I have the full 60 uh, supergravity landscape, then um, one thing I can say, as we've discussed a lot about universality, I will be uh, uh, conservative and just say, you know, uh, we don't know if you have universality in 60, but at least a large class of these theories we know that are string compactifications. OK, and inside this string landscape, a large class that we know are also Calabi-Yau landscape. And in particular, a very large class that we understand is a theory um, on elliptical labia threefolds that give you a lot of interesting theories. The usual story is that you have the three brains wrapping uh, curves on the base that give you different tensors and strings in your theory. You have non-abelian gauge symmetry associated to Kodara singularities and stuff. 
And there's a nice map between these anomaly coefficients we just saw, this minus a with the canonical bundle of the base, and these b's with the classes, the curve classes in the base. And there's something called the Kodara condition, which kind of tells you, uh, you know, how can I put different types of uh, singularities together uh, to have a consistent uh, elliptic vibration. Okay. So f one can wonder whether, for example, I can understand this kind of condition. Uh, what does this tell me from a supergravity perspective? I mean, from supergravity, these charges are gravitational instant on charges and gauge instant on charges, so they have a well-defined uh, way to understand them. And then you can wonder if these are related this way, could it be that some similar relation, I wrote it in terms of an inequality where J is either the Kähler class, if you're doing Calabria, or the uh, scalars in the tensor multiplet, if you're just doing supergravity, and for example, they give you the tensions of the strings, and you can ask whether you can have some similar condition to be true. Actually, in eight, in eight dimensions, 16 supercharges, you do have a similar condition that was shown to be satisfied from uh, bottom up. So you could wonder whether there's something true here. Maybe it's some kind of conservation of instant on charge in a gravity theory or something like that. Okay, then the next question, I guess, here is, okay, so one thing, one uh, issue here is that we always get one guy for free, and this is what we call the universal hypermultiplet. So, so the thing is, how special is this universal hypermultiplet? Is it something that is uh, something very physical or an artifact of our uh, compactifications? Because you always get one neutral hyper controlling the volume of the base in these constructions. Uh, however, if you check the anomalies we saw earlier, there is nothing wrong with just having no neutral hypers whatsoever. So you can ask if I can realize such a theory. And the thing is that there's nothing, and this is what I'm going to talk about, that there's nothing in 68 supercharges uh, in particular that I need to have this universal guy. Okay, so a question you could ask then is that, okay, if I have this universal in this theory models, is there a way that I can go on this Higgs branch and it can be charged at some point? Okay, so I'm going to go back to the 80s here with George Michael and the the song that was on the billboard <laughs> that year, uh, A Different Corner, <laughs> and uh, talk about a different corner <laughs> around here. And this will be basically exactly something from that year, uh, which was the asymmetric orbifold constructions. This is old news, it's not new things. Uh, but what is new and interesting is that you can find still new stuff by old uh, methods. And that's what we're going to do here. So if we're going to be asking uh, whether I can have in 60 this non-neutral hyper, whether I can have theories that violate this condition that all geometric theories, I mean, I only spoke about F theory, but you can do other geometric orbifolds, brain constructions, and you can see that nothing violates this. More precisely because you can think of it in a duality frame, you're going to end up in F theory, and they're kind of satisfied. Okay, so you can ask this question, and then you can also ask whether these guys can be connected to the geometry, uh, which basically tells us that you know, if, if I was to think about, and at some point I was thinking about whether this is a swarm of condition or not, based as I said, some kind of conservation of instant charges and stuff, whether uh, our, our intuition comes from a lamp post by just studying specific things we know how to do, or whether there's more beyond that and, you know, we're in a stringy lamp post situation. Okay, so just a very short review. Uh, if you just want to do an abelian orbifold, uh, you don't have to do too much. You just pick your favorite uh, string theory to A to B heterotic, and then you pick your favorite even self-dual lattice here for your momenta, and you can compactify. And how we do this is to create an orbifold is that we pick some lattice automorphism, uh, which we say tax as an automorphism of the lattice in that dimension, this crystallographic action. And then once I know all the possible actions, then I know uh, the symmetries that I can use. So I can use certain twists and certain shifts along the lattice. 
and this is how they act on my Hilbert space, the twist and shift, and then find new theories. So this is old news, it's not something most of you have seen, but in the symmetric case especially, we know you have Calabi-Yaus that have these uh, nice uh, orbifold points and stuff. And, and there if you choose the left and right um, actions to be not the same but different, then these are the asymmetric orbifolds. And the reason that you can think of them as non-geometric is quite simple because when it's symmetric, you really have a way to think about how this acts on the coordinates of the target space. But when it's asymmetric, it is not as obvious. Although there is something you already know, and it's t-duality that you know it acts uh, asymmetrically, and then if you do it twice, it is a symmetry of your theory. So you kind of already know uh, an action of that form. So this is what we're going to be focused today. Okay, so let me give my first example. So we have lots of, yeah. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, so I mean, the way you usually, I mean, I didn't put details, it's like you consider the untwisted sector, which is your invariant states, and then when you want a partition function to be modular invariant, you can do modular transformations to see that you actually need more. So, and this is the twisted Hilbert space. So you have strings that are closed up to G action, and this gives you the twisted partition functions that you have to add, and then the total thing is modular invariant. Yes, for the yeah, for example. Okay, so here we picked uh, a default lattice, and we did a very simple uh, twist where we uh, choose uh, to break uh, all of the right moving supersymmetry by uh, minus one to the f, which we saw earlier today, and we do a, um, a z2 to break the other ha the half of the left moving supersymmetry. Uh, in this case, so we can end up in eight supercharges, and you can check actually that the spectrum of this theory, even though it seems very simple, in fact has nine tensors, 12 u1s, charged matter, and no hypers at all, uh, neutral hypers at all. So this is not something you would get from an F-theory construction. As simple as it is, it's a new theory that I didn't know before, that you have no neutral hypers in 60. And what is interesting is that now, you, though your string coupling usually lives in these hypers, it actually lives in these tensor multiplets. Although this is not entirely surprising, I mean, it is surprising maybe from the type two picture, but you do also know theories that have string coupling in vectors and stuff, and this usually come from heterotic uh, construction. So it would be interesting to know if there's a relation to these models. Okay, so we're. Excuse me? No, no, this is also anomaly free. You need to plug in the charged matter. Okay, so f um, uh, what was I saying? Oh yeah, so and yes, please if you have questions or I'm confusing anyone, please ask me. So okay, so we definitely have one model here with no neutral hypermultiplets that is sitting in here. Now the next question can be again, can we uh, satisfy this? And the thing is that yes, in that model that I just talked about, the Kodaira condition is also satisfied. However, if you do now an, a heterotic asymmetric orbifold, um, again, we're looking for the same thing, no neutral hypers. Uh, you can pick your favorite lattice again. We just took an A2 plus A2 and the two E8s. We took um, uh, a right moving uh, twist by this uh, Z3 action. We did a, a shift for the heterotic lattice and find 16, eight supercharges again and the spectrum of this form. You have one tensor, large gauge group, lots of charged matter, and no neutral hypers again. Great. And then you're gonna ask again the same question, but here actually you see that the matter I just described over here does not satisfy the Kodara condition. So this gives me the first example that I know that actually uh, this, this condition is not as generic, even though our constructions we knew satisfied it. So um, that is interesting by itself to be able to wonder about more types of constructions before we uh, think about attacking uh, general questions. 
And then uh, what is interesting is to ask whether there is a connection to geometry in this picture. Well, in fact, if you Higgs this theory, you can uh, take, you have so much charged matter and you Higgs the theory, you actually find one tensor, E8, no charged matter, and 492 neutral hypers. And some of the F theorists in the uh, crowd or even heterotic people know this model. And this is familiar uh, because it is the F theory model with a base F12 uh, that just brings you the E8 model. Now you can ask me, why do I think this is the model? I mean, the massless spectrum is that way. It doesn't necessarily have to be, and that is true. Uh, but at least at the massless spectrum, it looks like it could be related to this, which I'm going to come back to. Okay, so f one more thing is that for now, let's assume that uh, we have this Higgsing to this Calabria threefold with base F12. Then we also know through duality we can connect this to a heterotic model on K3 with instant on number 0 and 24. Okay. Now, if you consider the theory on a circle, what is quite nice here is that actually you can see this in the same moduli space. So what is going on here is that the heterotic asymmetric orbifold that we just did, that had no neutral hypers, um, and these other theories are part of the same, uh, part of the same uh, moduli space. And then you can ask, for example, if I was to go from this theory to that theory, what am I actually doing? So what I'm doing is that I'm actually going on the Higgs branch in a way of the, of the base hypermultiplet, and I'm going to a very small volume regime and strong coupling, and I have this kind of conifer-like transition to this heterotic asymmetric orbifold. And of course, from that picture, it's not obvious why this should be, because from the F-theory perspective, this is a strong coupling, so it's not something you can actually trace. But it's very suggestive. But you can be a little bit smarter than this, and these people also were, and actually see that this model here, uh, you can see it from the heterotic picture itself. So there is actually, uh, on this model, a self-dual radius point where the string theory is perturbative, and you can end up with the same spectrum as this asymmetric orbifold. So now you actually have a perturbative description of what is going on from the F-theory picture in the strong coupling. So it is very suggestive now that, in fact, this picture is correct. And you can uh, have these extra transitions at these non-geometric points that your geometry breaks down. And you, know, you can treat these scalars also as part of your moduli space. They can undergo transitions, et cetera. And this shows a very nice connected picture of this model. In fact, you can go and do more. So this is the original theory I talked to, the type two. This was the heterotic I just discussed, and I give you two more heterotic models with some twist and shift. For example, this model, we're doing a CHL-like autoautomorphism between the two E8s. And you get a nice spectrum for these theories. Uh, here, with charged matter, none of them have neutral hypers. I just didn't write the charged matter because it's long. Uh, and the interesting thing is that none of these guys satisfy the Kodara condition, in fact. So actually, it's more generic getting these heterotic models to not satisfy the Kodara condition. And in fact, if you Higgs all these models and play exactly the same story, in these, you get exactly uh, the Calabria with base F12, F0, and F3 from the ethereal picture. We know the duals in terms of heterotic theory. And again, you can play the same game and go to the self-dual point in the K3, uh, where you actually find the uh, non-neutral hypers uh, uh, asymmetric orbifold point, which is really nice here. We are lucky, and we have a nice perturbative description of this dual frame where F theory was actually strongly coupled. Now, in this case, if you were doing exactly the same thing, you would have found Calabria with base DP9. This is no longer a perturbative heterotic string. This is actually, you have to go to the Hojava Witten or M theory uh, description of that because, or you can think of it in terms of K3 with NS5 brains. You can maybe hope that, in fact, this sort of uh, self dual points still exist when I add this uh, NS5 brains, but it's not so obvious to actually uh, go and find that theory. But it is very suggestive. So now we have all these theories. 
And one more thing is that, as we saw, all these things have this um, M theory on the hojava witten uh, times K3 uh, description. And we know that the instant numbers are related to how many brains are having inside of the interval or in the middle of the interval. And we know that go we can just push them on the boundaries, bring them in. And from the F theory picture, it, it corresponds to a blow up, blow down, or going from a tensor branch to Higgs branch transitions. So then you can, in fact, connect also all these theories this way as well, through uh, tensor branch transitions. OK, that's great. In fact, I was telling you that you can do this in one dimension lower, right? Because I needed, the, uh, the, I needed them to be part of a moduli space. So in fact, all these theories gives you this 5D Coulomb branch with U1 to the 22. And this gives you, if you um, turn on some uh, uh, Wilson lines, so you can get rid of the charged matter, and then you have a U1 to the 14 over here. And this is the connectedness of the string vacuum I was just talking to you about, where you have the Coulomb branch, uh, we just saw this one, uh, being related to the Higgs branches of the F0, F12, and the P9 models I showed you earlier. These are related through instant on tension branch transitions. And it shows you how now all of them are part of a single sort of moduli space in the lower dimension theory. And you can go to this asymmetric orbifold points just by doing simple geometry. OK. Now you can continue asking that question to lower, dimen lower dimensions. And in fact, people have already studied, and the paper has already come up, um, where they studied free actions in 5D. And we wanted to also understand um, what, what kind of uh, theories with no, with no hypers at all now in 5D you can get. As I said, they already did some here, and we're doing as well, where we also do freely acting orbifolds, and we add a shift. Uh, uh, so you do a normal orbifold, and then to get it freely acting, you add a circle, and you shift along that circle, which leaves all your twisted sectors. OK, and this is a table of the theories we got. We got rank from 2 to 22 from um, uh, all models we tried. I mean, we just gave you some representatives, so we don't give you over and over again the same ranks of the models. Uh, but what is interesting here is that the rank is even, which was also noticed in the other paper. We couldn't actually beat that. Uh, where's the reference? Ah, there. OK, the rank is even, so we had the same conclusion, and that the rank is bounded. An interesting thing is that for all these no neutral hypers, the rank is bounded by the same uh, bound that is true for 16 supercharges that we talked earlier. Is, that, is there a reason why this no neutral, the no hyper theorists sort of act like more 16 supercharges? Know that it's not just freely acting. Some of these models were not freely acting, the ones that we discussed from 60. We still couldn't beat it even with not freely acting uh, theories. So it is interesting to know whether this is a general thing or it is a very specific thing to the uh, maybe perturbative string landscape we're discussing. And of course, that comes back to what Miguel and Sam were discussing earlier, too, for r equals to 0. This is the 5D pure supergravity. It's 5D, n equals to 1, 8 supercharges. Uh, R equals to zero. Does this theory exist? This is what we were trying to get and obviously couldn't. Well, um, you, we couldn't get it this way, and we actually argue that you can't get it. And I mean, the, it's very simple why you can get it directly is because you have no scalars, and a perturbative string theory will always give you at least one. So it's not a perturbative string theory. You can ask whether you can get it from a 4D with one vector multiplet. Well, we argue that you can't, at least for abelian orifolds. So maybe you can be smarter and find a theory that can. Uh, but you can wonder that maybe it comes from 3D. So the idea of the 4D with one vector is something that it acts like M theory. So you take type 2 and the strong coupling, it decompactifies to this with no scalars. Uh, you could ask maybe in this case it's a 3D model and not a 4D model that decompactifies. So what you're looking for now is a 3D model with two, uh, with with the right amount so that uh, you have two scalars to decompactify potentially. And we have taken a six lattice with certain twists. And uh, the question is, could this be our theory? Because we find exactly the right spectrum. 
that you have for that theory. Now, we know the emergent string conjecture uh, uh, will tell us that the theory should decompactify the infinite distance limits or uh, it be a string limit. So, I mean, if you're lucky enough and it decompactifies, then that's your theory. <laughs> but, uh, for example, if you take the radius of the circle, um, you get extra supersymmetry, not interesting. But at strong coupling, we don't know what is happening, and you would need to know the instant corrections to actually know. But you have a potential example with minimal amount of matter such that it could potentially decompactify to your 5D push per gravity that has no scalars at all. Okay, and uh, I will conclude with a uh, couple of things that, um, one thing actually that I'm thinking also about now is as I just discussed, we were discussed a billion orbifolds with these uh, crystallographic symmetries at TD. There's some more general framework called quasi-crystalline compactifications where you actually consider automorphisms not of your target torus but rather than of the lattice itself. So you want uh, automorphisms that are crystallographically in 2D dimensions and not D dimensions, and this gives you more general orbifolds. The way you do it has kind of the opposite way. You first sort of find this, the, these automorphisms, and then you build the soft dual lattice that you, could, you, you want uh, to have uh, to be consistent. And uh, these are, for example, some preliminary uh, theories that we get. Uh, it's not, I, I didn't see something super interesting in the sense that we already know. What is interesting is that these are different types of constructions and you still get, for example, this uh, 60 theory with 21 tensors, the chiral theory. You get the equivalent of um, F theory on a Calabria with DP9 base, but from this quasi-crystalline compactification. And for this freely acting orbifolds, you can have potentially a string island in 60, so this is a 5D with one vector and 16 supercharges. It's normal to expect that this would decompactify. Then you would have another string island from this quasi-crystalline picture. Could be connected to the already known uh, quasi uh, to the already known string island, but it's not obvious. And uh, you have a lot of super non-supersymmetric examples, which they all have tachyons, unfortunately, unless uh, you do the free action, which we're doing, and then at some above some radius, you know that you won't have a tachyon. But I would say that this is not um, extremely interesting in the sense that you, you know, we know examples like that. But what is interesting is that you, know, you have a minimal amount of scalars. For example, this is with two scalars and no tachyon above certain radius. So you have a very minimal amount of matter in these in this theories. And well, we have a whole list of these. So uh, why they're called quasi-crystallines? Because exactly they have, uh, you don't, your P left and P right actually are, uh, are not, uh, what was I talking ah, They're not, uh, they're never two. They're either zero or they're rational numbers. So you can't, it kills a lot of massless modes. That's why we got so many, a uh, small amount of massless modes. And uh, this is the picture of these. This gives you actually rational CFTs. So why, that's why sort of it's interesting to see how these irrational CFTs are connected to the rest of the moduli space. And to summarize and discuss some um, general things is that, uh, as I said, these non-geometric models and things beyond geometry are great for uh, strong plan conjectures, trying to really, you know, I want to be able to understand the, the string uh, landscape first. Uh, to uh, sort of uh, try to understand more specific um, aspects of what I think is universal. Understanding boundaries of the, la uh, the landscape, string landscape. It would be nice to know if that 5D pure program exists, if you can argue that, for example, that it does decompactify. Looking for more examples to try to understand if you can have other not supersymmetric theories which are tachyon free. And of course, there, I mean, we have a whole discussion, so I didn't want to like steal a thunder with too many questions. But I think it's uh, interesting to explore this and explore different aspects of maybe these non geometric string constructions beyond these also uh, overfolds uh, to see what else we can have. Yeah, thank you very much.
Thanks. Could you explain again this transition, this geometric transition, how you how you related these um, uh, non-geometric theories to the elliptic vibration? Well, are, are you saying that you shrink the base and then do the Higgsing? Is that what? You're yeah. Saying, so basically, the so the thing is that from that pers you expect the model Higgs is there. So you expect that in the one-dimensional lower it will be a Higgs a Higgs Brown transition that has happened, and you get to the asymmetric orbital. But because it's a strong coupling in F theory, it's not obvious to argue for it. Uh, but because in that case you have a heterotic perturbative model, you can actually do it perturbatively in heterotic and find that exact asymmetric orbifold fault uh, from the K3 picture. And then uh, if you were to trace it back and see what you did in F theory because you have the duality, then what you actually did is that you shrunk the volume of the F theory base to zero size, your neutral hyper got charged, which was your string coupling, and you ended up at that non-geometric phase. That doesn't give an SCFT in five dimensions, the shrinking of the base? S SCFT, why? Th the, the shrinking of the base, does this in five dimensions, does this not give an SCFT, a 5D n equal one SCFT? Uh, I, you haven't decoupled gravity in that case. Well, okay, fine, but apart from that, like, that, but that's what you're doing. So you go, you go to this point where you... Yeah, you go, you basically, you you you're the treating it as another Higgs branch yeah. uh, okay. transition or a complex structure deformation you could have done that you don't see from the geometric picture. Thanks, Corey. Super nice talk and work. So I just wanted to ask, so you were mentioning you have the five-dimensional model that would decompactify to six dimensions to give you a string island, right? Mm -hmm. uh, why couldn't you just try and get the string island diagram in six dimensions? Why did you go? I uh, oh, think why you have it, to go down that it's route. It's cheap. So <laughs> it, it, because uh, these quasi crystalline things only are on uh, even dimensions. So I have ah. to do it on even dimensions and then uh, uh, do the free action and shift. Oh. So I needed to go directly there and then potentially up again. Okay, thanks. Well, I've thought about that, but it's not obvious to me. Actually, I want to bring that up in the discussion. It's not obvious to me how to understand this asymmetric orbital points from a non-geometric uh, construction. I don't know if people know, because at the end of the day, some of these, like, take the duality. You're kind of exchanging brains of different dimension. I don't know how to think about this with gravity decoupled. Uh, if I was to say that I have maybe a new kind of singularity that consider a new time of CFT, I'm not sure. I'd Actually, I wanted to bring it up in the discussion. I don't see any more questions, so it's... Thank you.